All right, so let's um, let's think about what firms do. Um, so let's look at one. Uh, let's let's look at one representative firm. Um, okay, so um, what's happening on the on the firm side? So first of all, um, the firm is going to you know, have these workers. So you know that the firm has. Uh, L workers, so we have R recruiters, and we have N producers. Okay, um, so what do they do with, with these guys? Um, so first, um, you know, if we think about the firm, we always have to think about the um, you know, the profit that the firm is going to make. So we have to think about uh, the income uh, for the firm and we have to think about the cost that the firm uh, is, uh, you know, is incurring. Um, so on the positive side, so what the firm is going to do, so first the firm is going to use these workers to produce stuff. So the firm is going to engage in um, production. Um, and so uh, we'll have a production function that describes how firm produces goods or uh, services. So the production function, we're going to keep it uh, you know, fairly general. Uh, so the production function is telling us that, that we're going to assume, is telling us that the output of the firm, it's going to be some parameter that we call A, and A is going to represent the technology level, technological advancement of the firm, times N. N is the number of producers in the firm, so these are the workers who are actually engaged in production. The number of recruiters doesn't matter for the production because these guys don't have time to produce anything, they're only involved in recruiting. And then we'll allow for the production function to have different shapes. So we have a, a shape parameter that we call alpha here. Um, so alpha is going to tell us whether the production function is um, linear or, or concave. Uh, so basically it's going to allow us to have either constant returns uh, to labor or diminishing returns uh, to labor. Okay? So here in this production function, y is the output by the firm. A is uh, just a parameter that represents technology level of the firm. So if you have a big A, it means your firm is very productive, have a, a high level of technology. If you have a low A, the firm is uh, not very productive. So it's technology level. You can think of it also as labor um, productivity. It's a parameter that captures labor productivity. Okay, And alpha, so alpha is going to be between 0 and 1. So of course not zero, otherwise it labor is operating, but we will allow it to um, be one. And that can, you know, it's just the shape, uh, the shape of the production function, and it will allow us to change the marginal returns uh, to labor. So have either constant or diminishing marginal returns to labor. So we have a production function, so that's going to tell us, that's going to determine uh, the income that the firm uh, that the firm makes. Um, okay, you can think so the firm is going to sell all that stuff. Um, well, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll look at that uh, also. So we have this production function, right? So um, all this stuff is sold on some uh, goods market. For now, we we'll just you know, if you want to know like what is the price of these goods and services, you can just think that the, you have a price P equal one. Okay, uh, so the goods or services that are produced by the firm have the have a price of one. Uh, so what we we say that these goods and services act as a numerator. Uh, they are used to count uh, value in the model. Okay, so in models in which you have money. Money is often used as a numerator. Here we don't we don't have money, so we're going to use uh, the good service as uh, the good services that are produced by the firm as a numerator. Okay. 
Okay? So if you want, the goods and services are the unit of account in the model here. Um, so this is something when you develop macro models, you always have to uh, think about what's going to be your unit of account. Uh, so here the goods and services produced by the firms are the unit of account. You can always pick whatever unit of account uh, you want. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, so firms is going to have all these workers, use them for production, so these goods. Okay. Uh, what about the cost incurred by the firm? Um, so um, the firm will have to pay. Here we, you know, we don't really have um, inputs or capital, so the only cost that the uh, firm is facing is the labor cost, and um, the firm will have to pay a wage W, which is positive. Then the wage uh, paid by the firm to all its workers. Okay. Um, so here there are several things, I guess. Uh, so one is that we assume that the firm pays the recruiters and the producers exactly the same. Um, okay, so that's, that's an assumption we make here to simplify. Um, and um, we also assume that the firm takes the wage as given. Uh, so there are models uh, that make different assumptions. So there are models that, uh, that are called uh, model of monopsony that assume that firms are very big on the labor market and so they have some market power that allow them to set their wage. Um, here, we don't make that assumption. We are rather thinking about firms that are uh, either don't use their market power or are small, so that firms just take the wage uh, as given. So it could be that, you know, the, there could be several stories here. Um, I mean, it could be that um, the wage is set by law, like a minimum wage in some sectors, or the wage is set by some a big uh, union, so that the firm just takes the wage as given. Um, it could be that there are wage norms for different occupations, the, the firm just abides um, to this wage. So um, in, the in the future lectures, we're going to delve a little bit more into the theories of where the wage comes from and different theories of wage determination. Um, but for now, we just assume that the firm takes the wage, uh, the wage as given, and given that wage, they are going to do the best they can, so they are going to pick the best worker, number of workers that they can. Okay. Um, so let me just say that later we are going to look at uh, different things, like uh, you know, we are going to look at what happens if you have bargaining between workers and firms to determine the wage. Uh, we are going to talk a bit about uh, unions and so on. Well, now we just take the wages given. Okay. Um, okay. So, what is the total labor cost then if you have to pay all your workers uh, W? So, the labor cost faced by the firm is just going to be W times L. All the workers are paid W. And if we want to express that as a function of the number of producers, which is the number of workers that are involved in production. You can write this as W times R plus N. Um, and we know that the number of recruiters is just equal to the number of producers times the recruiter-producer ratio. So we can rewrite this, actually, the labor cost, we can rewrite it as uh, W times 1 plus tau of theta times n. Why? That's because R, the number of recruiters, is just the recruiter-producer ratio times the number of producers. Okay? Uh, so this, you know, let me, let me just flag that because this relation, you know, this relation is, of course, completely key and we'll use it uh, many, many times. Um, but so we can replace the number of recruiters by tau of theta times n. Uh, because we know that for a given tightness and a given job separation rate, the ratio between recruiters and producers is completely fixed. It's outside of the, uh, you know, the firm cannot do anything about it. Um, so just because they take tightness as given, they just take the recruiter-producer ratio as given. So once they face, they face a certain tightness uh, and they want a certain number of producers and the number of recruiters comes out uh, immediately. They have no choice in the matter. They can't have a different number of, producers, of recruiters 
here otherwise they wouldn't be able to fill their vacancies and their size would vary over time. Okay? Um, so the labor cost is going to be W times 1 plus tau of theta uh, times n. Okay? So now we figured out the production and in fact we figured out the turnover of the firm because the price is just 1. We figured out the labor cost for the firm so we can figure out what the profits of the firms are. So the firm profit, which usually we denote with the letter, the Greek letter uh, pi. Uh, so the firm profit is just turnover minus labor cost. Okay. Uh, so what is our turnover? Well, it's the price at which we sell the firm sells all its production, which you know we said was p times how much is produced. So that's given by the production function. To get back to that, so p times y is how much uh, is produced. P is the price minus, if you want, w the labor, the wage times and the size of the firm. So at a high level, the firm profit is just given by this. So it's turnover minus labor cost. But we figured out a lot of these things. So p we said was one. Y the output is just given by the production function. So it's a times n alpha. And then W times N, we said was just W times 1 plus tau of theta times N. Right. Um, so here, this is quite good. This allows us to express on the firm side the profit only as a function of the number of uh, producers. Okay. Very good. Uh, So we are nearly there. Just a couple of points. So these profits, you have to think of that as a flow profits. So these are profits per unit time. You know, here, the firm has no, um, you know, in many models that we're going to see or that you will see in macro, the firm's problem is very dynamic. So it means that there is uh, variables that we call state variables that move slowly over time. And as a result, When a firm makes a decision today, it also impacts the future. And so the firm faces complex dynamic problems. So an example would be uh, if you have capital in your model. So the firm has to decide how much capital to invest today. So capital that you invest today, it has a cost today, but of course it will have repercussions in the future because your capital stock will be different. Then the firm has to solve a complex dynamic problem to know how investment has to change over time. Here there is no such thing. There is no state variables. Um, What the firm does is just at any point in time to choose how many producers or how many workers to have. And they can adjust that immediately by posting more vacancies. You can immediately grow your company by reducing the number of vacancies because workers are continuous, continuously leaving uh, the company. You can reduce the size of your company. And we assume actually that the flows in and out of the firm are always balanced so that your size of the company can just jump from one level to another. Okay, so we, you know, here there's a little bit of an abstraction. It's a bit of a simplification of reality in, in some firms, especially small firms. It takes, a, you know, it may take some time to build your, uh, your labor force if you want to grow or to shrink your labor force if you have few workers. Here we're thinking more about a very big firm that can very quickly adjust, uh, you know, that can uh, kind of adjust its size and that has many margins to adjust its size. Um, but there is a bit of a simplification by assuming that the firm is able to choose um, its level of employment just at will at any point in time. In, in reality, it's a bit more complex and it may take time to adjust employment. Um, but we do that just to have a slightly simpler model. So here, the firm uh, so has a, what we call a static problem because at any point in time, the firm is just trying to maximize its profits. There is no dynamic Uh, component to it. There is no intertemporal component to it. Uh, firms are not facing temporal trade-offs. 